in both of those chapters, we're going to be looking at the same verses. Verses 1 through 3a in both chapter 1 and chapter 3. As I was wrestling with the Lord, seeking a word for the people, He showed me this and it just automatically just set in my spirit that this was it. If you can't find Jonah, I think I still see some pages turn. If you can't find it, uh, look in the table of contents. It's in the Old Testament. It's kind of close to the book of Matthew. So if you find Matthew, back up a few, back up a few books and you will run into it. Jonah. Eric, I'm sure even the youth have heard about the story of Jonah. Amen. Jonah, the first chapter, reading from the NIV version, God says this. God's word says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. As we jump to chapter 3, the word of God says, then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. And just for a short while, we want to preach from this thought. The God of another chance. Amen. The God of another chance. Look at somebody and say the God of another chance. Amen. Now, the title of this sermon was given purposely because as you look at the, um, the third chapter, it says that the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. So the title of this message could have been the God of a second chance. But if you are like me, you ought to be grateful that God is not the God of only a second chance. Because if you are like me, you have messed up, you muffed up, you screwed up, you've done some things that were sinful, some things that were, were repulsive to heaven, and you've done it more than just once or twice. How many are not afraid to say that you've messed up more than twice? If God were the God of only a second chance, that means you could only mess up once. And then once you messed up, after you messed up the second time, there'd be no more hope for you. But God is not just the God of a second chance. God is the God of another chance, and a chance after that, and a chance after that. He's so loving, he's the God of another chance. And I'm so appreciative of that fact because the things that I have done, and I'm sure I speak to my, uh, the whole house, we've done some things more than once or twice, and God has forgiven us, restored us, washed us, cleaned us, regenerated us, revived us, brought us back into the fold, and we ought to be happy about that because God didn't just throw us away. He didn't just cast us out because we did something wrong. But God is the God of another chance. And I want to encourage somebody in the house today, if you are wrestling with something, all of us have done things against, against God, and if you are in that position, and you're seeking forgiveness, this word is for you. God is the God of another chance. If we don't understand anything else about this message, I'd like for us to understand this, that our response to God's grace and mercy should prompt obedience. Our response to God's grace and mercy should prompt obedience. So what does that mean? If, if it really doesn't need to be explained, but just in case you don't understand, when God does something for us that when he gives us things that we don't deserve, that's called grace. And when God holds things from us that we do deserve, that's called mercy. When he does those things for us, our response should be an action that signifies that we are going to obey God to the fullest because he's giving us another chance to get it right. Anybody ever remember being a, a youth? I don't know, some of us have to go far back. But being a youth, 
Anybody remember asking your parents for forgiveness and asking for a second chance? Amen. And well, how did you feel when mama and daddy said, okay, I'm going to give you another chance? Did that make you feel good? Yeah. Now, of course, uh, mama and daddy's grace was not grease. Amen. You can't keep sliding on mama and daddy's grace. Well, God is the same way. Even though the point that we're trying to stress and bring home is that God is the God of another chance, another chance, there is a thing as sinning once too much. There is a thing called sinning once too much. And we don't ever want to get to that point where God takes his hands off of us because we, he's allowed us to go so far and we want to keep being disobedient. And God says, okay, enough is enough. If you want to keep down that road, then I'm going to take my hand off you and turn you over to a reprobate mind, meaning that the good you think you're doing is really evil, but I'm going to make you think it's good. Yeah, yeah. We never want to get to that point. So let's not stress God and let's not stretch into the limit because God's grace is not grease. We can't keep sliding on it. But God is the God of another chance. And I'm so grateful for that. As we look at this text, as we said earlier in the opening, many of us are very familiar with the story of Jonah. Uh, as we look at the first uh, chapter of Jonah, we understand that uh, Jonah was given a commission by God. God told Jonah to go to Nineveh and to preach his word against those people. But because uh, Jonah had some bias, uh, he didn't like the people of Nineveh. They were his enemy. He hated them. And so Jonah said in his mind, well, instead of me going to do what God told me to do and obey God, I'm going to do just the opposite. So instead of going to Nineveh where he told me to go, I'm going to go the opposite direction to Tarsus. So he went down to Joppa. It says he boarded the ship. And when he boarded the ship, he got on the ship and he went down into the belly of the ship to sleep. And when this, this great storm arose, and after this great storm arose, the people on board began to ask, well, why is this storm here? Why are we going through this? And it came to find out it was because of Jonah. So Jonah said, if you throw me overboard, then the storm will stop. So they took him, they threw him overboard, down into the ocean. And then God had prepared this great fish who swallowed Jonah down into his belly. Somebody say down. down. The great fish then swam down to the bottom of the ocean. The point we made is that whenever we disobey God, yes. the only direction for us to go is down, yes. down, and down. Yes. So we never want to get to a, a, a place where we are disobedient to God because you can't go up and you want to go down. In chapter 2, Jonah begins to pray. He realizes that he has brought this calamity on himself. And I, I love it when it's already been said that Jonah came to a point of recognition that he couldn't blame nobody else. He could only blame himself for his misfortune. And so he began to talk with God. Why is it that we only talk with God when we're in trouble? Huh. Many of us only call out God's name when the, when the rent is due or when we need some money. But we don't want to call on God when things are good. We often call on God in times of hardship. So Jonah began to pray and he began to call on God and he trusted God for salvation. And he said, God, in, in so many words, you are my help and you are my salvation. And if you don't get me out of this mess, I'm, I'm going to die. So after Jonah repented, God turned the situation around. After he repented, so then God commanded the, 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 the fish, the great fish, to swim up to uh, the ocean. Then the, the fish spewed Jonah out of his mouth up on dry land. And then Jonah got up on his feet and he went up to Nineveh to preach God's word. So what it tells us is that when we begin to make up our minds that we're going to follow God, the only direction we can go is up. Even when down seems like up, if we're doing God's will, God will make up, down, and down up, even though we're in valleys. God says you'll be up because if we trust God, he'll make our valleys smooth places. So trust him. Chapter 3. Jonah went to Nineveh and he preached a message. And he, you could tell, you know he was hot. 
he, God saved him from the, from the fish, and he was just one. He, God told him to go and preach, and he couldn't get to preaching fast enough, but he still hated the people. So you can imagine how he was preaching. Y'all are going to die. The whole land is going to be just, you're going to be destroyed in 40 days. 40 days, destruction is coming. You are going to die, and you're going to hell. He was preaching from an angry heart because he didn't like the people. And so after he began to preach, he knew in the back of his mind why he didn't want to preach. Because he knew God was compassionate. And if the people were to make a change and repent, that God would restore them. So the people that Jonah was preaching to began to become so distraught and so dead set on making a change and making amends that they not only proclaimed the fast of the people, but they said all the animals that were in the nation couldn't eat the thing. They said, not only the people going fast, but we'll make the animals that nobody eat nothing until God has a change of heart. So I'm going to encourage you that if you're going through something and you don't have an answer, try fasting and praying. Because fasting and praying will change not only our situations, but it just may change the way we view our situation. And that can be worth all the gold in the world. If you have a different perspective of your circumstances, that can put you above the things that trouble you. So the people began to fast, they began to pray, and they began to sought, seek God, and guess what God did? God forgave them, and he relented of the calamity that he was going to bring upon them. And guess what Jonah did? Jonah was hot. This is what Jonah did. Jonah said, I don't believe this. This is ridiculous. I don't believe this. Foolishness. I hate these people. To modernize it, Jonah pulled up a chair, went to a mountaintop where he could see the city, and he was waiting for the people to be destroyed. It's like he had his bonbon and his popcorn, just eating and just waiting for the people to be destroyed. And God didn't destroy them. Now, is Jonah really a person that God could use? Here he is supposed to be a prophet of God, and yet he's wanting in the destruction of his people. Yes, God can use Jonah. And the point to be made is that God can use someone who is sitting down in the shade waiting for people to be destroyed. God can definitely use us. God can use us. He wants to use us. But we have to have a heart that's regenerate, that's repentant, so that we can focus on what God wants to do through and to us. God wants to use us. So if you think you're in a position where you're the least of many, where you don't feel like you're able, where you don't feel like you're much of anything, where you feel like you're downcast, you feel like you're destroyed, you're at the rock bottom, know that you are the exact candidate that God wants to use. He wants to use you. So in chapter 4, Jonah uh, begins to uh, lament, and God shows him a lesson. In chapter 4, as he had set up his table and set up all this stuff and was waiting for the city to be destroyed, God allowed a leafy plant to grow, which gave Jonah shade. And then uh, uh, the next day, a worm, God allowed a worm to come and eat that plant, and Jonah was just distraught. He was upset. He cared more about the leafy plant than he did about God's people. But God still used him. And God wants to use us today. God wants to use us. So as we look at our text, there are just three quick things I want to share with you that will soon be out of your way. The word of God says in this uh, chapter 1, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. Chapter 3, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. As we look at this first verse, the first thing I want to share with you is this. The word of God brings calling. The word of God brings a calling or calling. We see in, in, in both verse 1, in, in verse 1 of both chapters, chapter 1 and verse 3, it says the word of the Lord came to Jonah. 
So when, when, when God calls his servant Jonah, it was as if he was commissioning him for greatness. And today, God still speaks. He's calling us. He's calling us and commissioning us to do work. He wants us to do some things for him. And when God calls us, many of us think, well, I'm not qualified. I can't do that. I don't have enough skill. I don't have enough education. God says, when I call you, I will qualify you. And I'll give you everything you need. When God calls us, he doesn't want us to be perfect. He doesn't want us to be a perfectionist. He just wants us to be willing, and he wants us to be able. Lord, if you use me, God wants us to be willing to be used. Do you have a willing heart to be used? God brings calling. The second thing that I want to share with you is that the work of God brings conviction. Look at verse 2. It says, go to that great city of Nineveh and preach against it. And in chapter 3, verse 2 says, go to that great city of Nineveh and proclaim the message. So God's word brings conviction. When God, when God's word, uh, when God allows his word to come forth, the work that he wants us to do is to share his word. The work that God wants us to do is to proclaim his word. And when we proclaim the word of God, it's going to sometimes cause conviction. It's going to cause conviction in people. And that conviction is not a bad thing. If the conviction promotes and prompts us and good comes out of it. Sometimes, many times, we only uh, do what's right because we've been convicted. And so sometimes God has to bring conviction to get us to see the error of our ways so that we can change. God doesn't want to bring conviction to, 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 to harm us, but he brings conviction to help us. And the last thing I want to share with you this morning is that the walk of God brings choices, challenges, and hopefully change. The walk of God. Look at verse 3 of both chapters. Verse 3 says, but in the first, uh, in chapter 1, but Jonah ran away from the Lord. So we know that when we run away from God and when we disobey God, there's only one direction to go. That's down, down, and down. But in chapter 3, verse 3, we see a whole different new Jonah. He begins to obey God. And when he obeys God, the only direction to go is up, up, up. So that choices. When we begin to walk this walk, there are some choices that we have to make. And I, I try to tell my, my children to choose wisely. Everything in life has a decision and consequences that you have to make. And what you decide to choose can affect the rest of your life. So choose wisely. We all have choices to make. What's your choice going to be? Are you going to choose God and live? Or are you going to choose not God and have eternal damnation? The choice is ours. When we choose, it also brings challenges. God never said that when we uh, confess his, his name that this walk is going to be a bed of roses. He says there are going to be some challenges, some uphill battles that we have to fight. But God says, I am more with you than the world against you. So if we would allow God to walk in us and allow his word to work in us and allow the word to work and we begin to walk the walk, that we can walk the, the, the location where we are called so that we can uh, proclaim God's name boldly. God wants us to work, to walk, and use his word. And when we work the work and walk the walk, God says, I will speak through you, I will use you, and I will bring challenges your way, but I'm more than an overcomer. And when God allows us to walk, he wants us to change. The word of God comes to change us and to correct us and to convince us and to move us from where we are that may be wrong to the things he wants us to do. God says he wants us to change. So the word brings calling, the work of God brings conviction, and the walk of God brings choices, challenges, and hopefully change. Because God is the God of another chance. When we begin to live outside of God's will, we need to understand that God is the God of another chance. When we don't always do the things that God has commanded us to do, and you know, when, you, when we look at disobedience, how it hurts our hearts, we need to understand that God is the God of another chance. Sometimes we live 
we find ourselves living in sin. God says, I'm the God of another chance. So if you will turn from your evil ways and follow me, I will forgive you and I will cleanse you and restore you. When we do things that are out of desperation and we're not living in God's will, God says, I'm the God of another chance. When we find fault in ourselves and we do things that convict our hearts and we're so sorry for the things that we've done, we need to understand that God is the God of another chance. When we live outside of God's will and we find ourselves outside trying to get back into the ark of safety, know that God is the God of another chance. He's standing in the doors and he's knocking, wanting us to come in. When we find ourselves in trouble, God's the God of another chance. When we find ourselves in situations that we can't get out of, God is the God of another chance. He wants us to know that if we trust him, he's standing there with open arms to accept us and to welcome us back into the fold because God is the God of another chance. God bless you. Father, we are so grateful to you that your mercy and your grace are forever complete in forgiving us and restoring us and cleansing us and washing us and renewing us. And we thank you, Lord, that you don't just give us a second chance and call it through, but Lord, you give us time after time after time. And Lord, we want to say that we're sorry. We ask you, Lord, to forgive us for our sins. To forgive us, Lord, for our slow ways where we, where we break the heart of heaven. Forgive us, Lord, for when we've done things that were against your will, knowingly that we were committing those things. Lord, for the things that we do that we don't realize that we are doing that are wrong, we ask you to forgive us. And we are so grateful to you, Father, that you are the God of another chance. Forgive us, cleanse us, and regenerate us. In Jesus' name, amen.